Series. And there's one more vacancy to fill for the Grand Championship in Reno, Nevada, and we will fill that vacancy here tonight at the Country Club Lanes in Baltimore. Hi, everybody. I'm Bob Dolan, and alongside, once again, the great Hall of Famer, Earl Anthony. What a tremendous week we have had here at the Country Club Lanes. 80 teams, the most by far this year. Some great bowlers, too. John Mazza, Johnny Petraglia, Lisa Wagner. Just a great way, Earl, to send us off to Reno. And I'm looking forward to Reno, Bob. It's going to be a lot of fun there. Uh, we're, we're down, as you said, to the top three teams in this particular field. They came from 20 states, uh, some of them driving as far as or as much as 15 to 20 hours to get here in their cars. They know it's their last chance to get to Reno and to be the national team champion. Let's look at the field, and a good field it is. The number three seed, the Hoinke Classic team from Cincinnati. Led by Pat Healy, who's a very fine player, and, of course, Bob Bush, who's won one regional PBA event. Uh, this is the youngest team in the field, and I'm not sure if their experience if they have enough experience really to carry them through right to the championship. Uh, uh, I'm hoping they will, but you never know. This is, a, this is a very tough format. As you know, the Baker system and the number one team in this particular seed is very strong. And in that first semifinal match, they will take on Ebonite Crush R, another very good team. Very good team, and, uh, you know, they're, they, again, are a very strong team. Uh, this particular team has a lot of experience, and they're led by ABC Masters champion, Bud Light Masters champion of 1991, Doug Kent. Uh, they, the winner of that match will have their hands full. Yeah, they really will because our number one seed is just uh, loaded, John Mazza and others. John Mazza, who's a four-time PBA champion on the national tour. Ted Hanna is a three-time PBA champion on the national tour. Uh, they tossed in for experience. John Racina, who's uh, about 56 years old, but he's a 1991 PBA, I think 91 or 90, PBA Senior Player of the Year. A very fine player, a very strong team, and a very experienced team. I think they're the team to beat by far. So we've had a great week so far in Baltimore, but the best is yet to come, especially with that team from Detroit waiting in the championship match. Who's going to go to Reno to join the other 11 winners? We're going to find out real soon. The first semifinal match is coming right up, so don't leave now. Pride and service to bowlers since 1895. Make sure your league is ABC sanctioned. By the American Bowling Congress MasterCard. Get a grip on your finances with the ABC MasterCard. By the Reno Sparks Convention and Visitors Authority, offering the perfect game challenge. And by Pinbreaker Bowling Balls, bringing you the Pinbreaker Break of the Match. Bob Dolan and Earl Anthony back at the Country Club Lanes in Baltimore. First semifinal game, number three seed Hoinky Classic against the number two seed Ebonite Crush R. And Ebonite Crush R will begin things. Steve Klimpkin will lead it off. This is the number two seed, Klimpkin, a student at Wichita State University. And a little light on the first ball. Oh, we're bowling on fresh oil. Uh, they practiced for about 20 minutes before we got the match started, Bob, as you know, and uh, the oil really hasn't moved down the lane yet, so it's going to be a little hard for them to judge the ball reaction, and, and I think as they get started in the match, there's a little bit of nerves also involved. Easy spare here. Steve throw it hard and straight right at it. It's Steve a semifinal match uh, featuring two very young teams, Earl. Yes, but Steve is pretty experienced. He's been around a while. He's an outstanding collegiate player, and there you can see the hard, pretty straight shot there. Uh, he, along with Chris Barnes, are probably two of the finest collegiate bowlers we've had in the last 20 years. And uh, Chris Barnes, bowling anchor for the, for the Ebonite team, has also uh, been the national, individual national champion on the collegiate level. Now we go to the other end of the spectrum, Earl. John Murph, this is his first time on television, 20 years old for the Hoinke Classic Club. And you never know. The, the first time out, sometimes a player will just kill you. Next time, he can't do anything. And he looks like he's going to kill him. That's a <laughs> tremendous ball for the first time. And... Murph starts Hoinke's club out with a strike in the first, and that will bring us to Russ Mills, who is the veteran, I guess you would call him, of this Ebonite Crushar club, 43 years old. Everybody else in the semifinal match are all, only in their 20s. Well, Russ is an old man. I've known, <laughs> I've known Russ for a long time. Uh, we were both with the same ball company for a number of years. Russ still is with the ball company. Um, he's a down-and-in player, as you just saw by that shot. He doesn't do a lot to the bowling ball. He lets the surface of the ball and the surface of the lane interact and he gets good ball reaction just by being as accurate as he is that's how he strikes as much as he does but he won't get you in trouble he's the kind of player that keeps the team out of trouble and that's what you want out of the uh the bowler in the number two slot correct exactly Somebody nice Bob. and steady and uh, gonna keep you in the game that's right chris nice wainer 26 years old in the second slot for the hoinky classic team 
Boy, these kids are good-looking young guys, aren't they? Jeez, they look like movie stars out there. Thank you. A nice warner. Right in the pocket. This is his first time on television also. In fact, the Hoinke Classic team, Earl, only two of their bowlers have ever been on television. Healy and Bush. Well, Pat Healy's very experienced and a tough player. He's a good clutch player. Uh, he knows how to play the game quite well. Here's a good young man here, too. This guy can play. We saw Rob Causer at our last stop in New Jersey, bowling for the Pepsi Classic team, and Causer leaves the 10. He has been on uh, in the TV finals, Earl, in this National Team Challenge event three different times on three different teams. And has yet to win. Still looking for the first, <laughs> and they're running out of time. This is the, uh, the last stop, of course, before the Grand Championship in Reno. Most of the bowlers, now here's a good look again. Rob's going to go cross lane at the 10th pin. He'll throw the ball real hard to keep it on line so it doesn't hook. All right, that's fair. Most of the bowlers will be using the, what they call the reactive resin balls, which uh, to me are very hard to control. and It takes a high level of skill to be consistent with them. And, and of course, the players in this final three teams are all in that skill level. Pat Healy here, we talked about him already, Bob. He's a very fine player, uh, very successful pro shop operator. His qualifying round average, 231, which is the highest qualifying round average of any of the bowlers we'll see on television today. Just 24 years old and a great future ahead of him. Maybe we should talk just a little bit about the format here. The bowlers all bowl, all 80 teams yesterday bowled six games of qualifying in their, in their normal team format. Total pins got you in the top 10. As we see the leave here. Got a break. A nice break as the, the 10 falls down. And if you get into the top 10, you go into match play this morning. There were uh, 10 teams bowled 18 games of matches, nine matches, two games each match. Uh, and the Baker system. Now, the Baker system means if you see the number on the player's shirt there, number three, number eight, he bowls the third frame and the eighth frame each game. Number one and number five would be he bowls, or he bowls uh, excuse me, number one, number six would be he bowls the first frame and the sixth frame, and so on. And there's a major mistake by Pat. That's something he very seldom does is miss an easy spare. That's our first open of the, uh, of the match, Earl, and you cannot stress enough the importance of in the Baker to, uh, to fill the frames, and that's our first open. Right, and here on the show now, you'll, the teams are bowling a two-game total pins wins the match. So you'll really only get a chance to help your team four times in that two-game span. Doug Can again, is a, a very fine player, the 1991 Bud Light Masters champion. And his Ebonite club right now with a four-pin lead. Kent's first ball and expands the lead. Ken, of course, on the Pro Tour quite a bit. And in our championship uh, match, the Turbo 2 and 1 Grips team, we're going to find a couple of other Pro Bowlers, John Mazza included. This is Bob Bush of the Hoinke Classic Club. Bob has won a PBA regional event. He's not, uh, he's not uh, been out on the national tour for any length of time, but he's done well in the regional program. Leaves the 5 pin. He's 24 years old. A league average of... 228. <laughs> that's a pretty good game, but that's his average, right? <laughs> this is uh, this guy right here is one of the best funny men you'll ever is see. Is that right? Stand-up comic right. type. He can he can keep you laughing. He's a very funny man. But all business so far. We're through four frames, and the anchor man for Ebonite Crush R is Chris Barnes, also the captain of this club. Yeah. This young man can turn it up pretty good as you get a look at the score up to this point. A four-pin lead by Crush R with a chance to extend that with a strike here. Watch the revolutions on this ball. Lots of side roll. And there again is the reaction of the resin ball, the, the reactive cover on the ball. Got a little more break on it than he expected, and it breaks very sharply. Uh, the synthetic lanes were bowling on, 30 feet of oil. You get a lot of friction on synthetic lanes. You get a lot of friction off the cover shit or the stock of the uh, the shell of the of the resin ball, the reactive resin ball. So that com combination of frictions makes the ball react very quickly. Uh, takes that's why I mentioned it takes a high skill level to play successfully with this kind of bowling ball. Do things change, Earl? I mean, all these players had about 20, 25 minutes of warm up, and obviously they use that time to to line themselves up. But do things change from the time the warm up stops to the match begins? 
they will definitely change. Uh, each ball that's thrown down the lane will change the, the oil pattern. It'll move the oil around a little bit. It'll carry it down, uh, down the lane farther, past that 30-foot mark. And as the oil carries down, the, the shot actually gets easier because it keeps the ball on line longer. The ball doesn't overreact quite as much. This is the anchor man for Hoinke Classic, Brian Kretzer. Also the captain. His first ball. Tremendous hook there, huh? So we're halfway through this first game of the semifinal match, and the Ebonite Crushar Club leads by four over Hoinke Classic. We'll be right back. We're away in the sixth frame. Steve Klimkin for the Ebonite Crushar team, a strike. And John Murph for Hoinke Classic answered that with a strike. Murph is two for two today. And now that takes us to the seventh frame with the Hoinke Club up by six. And Mills buries another one. He's two for two. And keeps this match very close, which will bring us right back to Chris Nicewainer, the 26-year-old for the Hoinke Classic Club. Hoinke Classic team from Cincinnati, Ohio. And no TV experience for Murph, nice Wainer, and also for Kretzler, but they're doing well up to this point. You know, one of the nicest people in the bowling industry and one of the nicest guys I've ever met and great promoter, Irv Hoinke, is the guy that's sponsoring this team. And he does a great job in Cincinnati promoting the game. Just a great job. And nice Wainer. He buries one. He's two for two. And the Hoinke Club... Doing very well. They're still up by six. Eighth frame now, Rob Causer for Ebonite Crush R. A junior college All-American. And a league average of 232. That's just amazing to me. <laughs> a 232 average. Causer answers. And both these clubs are all doing very well in the sixth. In the eighth, excuse me. That gives Ebonite a, a four-pin lead and takes us back to Pat Healy, Jr. For Hoinke. Yeah, you got to remember, this is a two-game total pins match, so both teams really getting off to a great start here. The only mistake either team has really made that has hurt them is the one that Pat Healy made in his last attempt on in the, in the third frame uh, of this match. And that's very uncharacteristic of Pat Healy to miss an easy spare, Bob. What would that do, Earl, to uh, a... His confidence. I mean, as you've mentioned, you only get two balls per game, and his first one was a key miss. Well, I think Pat will come right back. He's uh, he's a very fine player. He knows how to play the game quite well. Oops, missed again, and my mistake again. Pat, the four six seven. Uh, he is lost, he's completely lost. You see the look on his face. And they're on three in a row. Pat will just go for the two in the left side here. Throw the ball hard and hope he can bounce one out of the pit to kick out the six pin. He'll throw it to 4-7. Out of ball speed. Monkey Classic Club beginning this semifinal match on lane 36. And after the first uh, game, they will switch lanes. Here's a look again at his first shot when he left the big split. And he gets the ball out near the channel. And I feel he felt that he'd rolled it quite well. This looks like a great shot until right at the end when it jumps. Cuts through the heart of the pins at 4 6 7. And Ebonite Crush R now with a 19 pin lead as we enter the ninth frame. So those two open frames by Pat Healy have been critical. And here's where you want your experienced players to finish the game for you. You got Doug Kent, the Masters champion, and of course Chris Barnes coming up after him. They need to throw strikes. And there's two for two for Doug Kent. And Ebonite pours the pressure on. Bob Bush will try to answer in the ninth for Hoinke. Under the Baker system, any game over 210 is a fine game. And this, right now, they're rolling along at a 220-plus pace for Ebonite. And, of course, the Hoinke Classic team going at a 201 pace. Bush gets the 10-pin to fall at the end. Bob, I mentioned this before, and when we've done the telecast before, about how important it is for the team that's sitting and bowling on lane 35 to watch the team on 36 bowl and vice versa. The mm -hmm. reason being the lanes obviously are going to be a little bit different. And so you watch the ball reaction of your opposition so that you can make adjustments before you get to the lane. You don't want to waste shots. And knowing that they're good players, they're going to try to be making good shots. You can watch how the ball reacts and learn a lot. If you, if you don't do that, you're just penalizing yourself and costing yourself a chance to, to waste a shot to line up in the first five frames. 
A 39-pin lead now for Ebonite Crushar as we enter the 10th frame and the anchor man for Ebonite Crushar, Chris Barnes. This is his uh, third TV appearance this year. He and Klimkin both on in the TV finals three times. Big hook. And that's disaster for Ebonite right there. They had a chance to really put it to uh, the Hoinke Classic team, get a big lead, a possible 250 game. And uh, this could bring him down into the two teens and make it a very, very small difference in the total pin match. Only just, you know, five or six pins if Hoinke Classic should strike out in the 10th. The 210, Earl. Nobody likes to see that. No, and uh, Chris Barnes is a good spare shooter. He will go down the left side of the lane, I think, with pretty good speed on this and not try to hook it. Uh, just get enough of the two pin to slide it into the 10. Almost. And an open in the 10th for the anchor man, Chris Barnes. And as Earl indicates, that will bring the Hoinke Classic Club right back into this match. We got 16 there. Yeah, 216. 216 for the Ebonite that's team. That's a tremendous game. Could have been 250. So that's a 34 pin swing for the Ebonite team. What they could have had was 250. Now the Hoinke Classic team, possible 211. It's only a five pin mm -hmm. difference, basically. Hoinke has to feel pretty fortunate they're back in the match right now. The anchor man and the captain, Kretzer. There it is. Now, he's fun to watch. Isn't he fun to watch? He doesn't throw it very hard. He uses an awful lot of the lane, and it takes tremendous speed control to create that kind of an arc and keep it under control. Now, watch where he lays the ball down. Clear in the center of the lane, inside the fourth arrow. Clear out to almost the first part of the lane, the first board, and back to the pocket. I had a nice chat with the Kretzer before uh, before the match, Earl, and he said he and his club was very confident, despite the fact that very few of them have ever been on television. They felt good about their chances. Well, that's what you have to be. It's really it's a mental game at this point. The, the, the uh, physical parts of the game right now are fairly even. When you get to this level of play, there isn't a lot of difference physically in how well you play the game. It's how much confidence you have and how well, when you get to the final line, how good a shot you can make under pressure. He liked that ball, too, but the 10 is still standing. The difference between that ball and the one before was just a difference in the break point down the lane. That ball was farther down the lane before it gripped the lane, uh, closer to the pins, in other words, and so it naturally came in behind the hit pin a little bit, and that was the solid 10. So the Ebonite Crush Art Club will have the lead after this first game, but it will be a very small one indeed as Kretzer converts the spare and completes our first game in this two-game total pinfall match with the Ebonite Crushar Club up by 15 after the first. 216, 201. We'll be back with the second one right after this. 216, 201. Ebonite Crushar over the Hoinke Classic Club, but it is a two-game total pinfall match and this is the first frame of the second game john murph for hoinky classic murph remember in the first game two strikes gotta hurry at this one and again they have changed lanes hoinky now on lane 35. different ball reaction from lane to lane and here's another look at the shot he gets it well down the lane way down the lane before it grips the lane. It's way behind the head pin. No chance to get back to the pocket. He'll try to cross this one over in front of the head pin. The one, two, four, ten. Try to slide the one into the ten. When your first ball on the new lane, Earl, is that far off target, how do you feel about the spare shot? Are well, you, the spare you shots... Are hunting? Spare, no, you're not really. No? Not, not when the spare's in the middle of the lane because you know there's more oil basically in the middle of the lane that hasn't been touched, so you're going to get an honest reaction. So you're going to throw the ball pretty hard and pretty straight down the middle of the lane and don't expect it to do much. And, and that's basically what John did there, and uh, he was close. He was within an eighth of an inch of making that spare. 60 feet, that's not bad. It's close. Steve Klimkin now leading off for Evanite. Again, they started with a 15-pin lead in this semifinal match, and the crossover and the five won't go. And you can see the different reaction they're getting from one lane to the other, and I, plus the fact that Steve made a move on the lane there. He moved out more toward the, to the, to, toward the channel, tried to go a little more direct here with the shot, as you see it, and got off his hand early there. And when that happens, it's going to grip the lane sooner and go left, and that's exactly what happened for Steve there on that shot. Steve is a 1991 Team USA member and a member of the Wichita State National Championship team. They won that title a couple of months ago in Indianapolis. 
this a chance for Steve to line up. You see him making a little different shot there. The five pin being right in the pocket area. He uses that for, to, for a lineup shot, like a practice shot. So in the next chance to get the ball on that lane, he knows where to throw that strike ball. Now back to Chris Nicewainer for Hoinke Classic. Finalist in the uh, the Turbo 2 and 1 Grips Club, 208 in qualifying, and in the Baker, 202.8, and a tremendous score in the Baker. All of them, Ebonite Crushar, 205 in the Baker. What's well, the interesting one here, Bob, is the Hoinke Classic team, the fact that they average 198 in Baker, but look at their, their one loss record. They won seven matches out of the nine, and what that tells you is you get the right, the right team on the right pair, and you, win, you beat them, and you get the bonus pins, and there you are. And nice Wainer, the change of lanes has not affected him at all as he buries another one. Well, oh. he made an adjustment off his team's ball. I think after his teammate bowled and you saw him get the washout, Chris got up there and he says, well, I got to get a little more on this one or I got to go a little more direct, which he did and got the strike. Here's a guy that the lane condition isn't going to affect mm -hmm. very much. He goes real straight with it, kind of an end over end accuracy player. Little on the Brooklyn side for Chris Mill or Russ Mills. And Russ stood up at the foul line with that one. He wasn't comfortable with the release. I know that because I know Russ's game pretty well, bowling with him for a long time. Got a little fast with his feet, stood up the foul line, pulled it left. Has his game changed at all, Earl, uh, through the years that you've noticed? Uh, yeah, he's got a little more direct. Uh, as you get older, you mm -hmm. don't get quite as much on it. You know, the, uh, the back and the knees and everything won't take the wrist, won't take the stress. So you start going straighter and straighter. And Mills picks up the spare, so we're through two frames of the second game of the semifinals between Hoinke and Ebonite Crushar. We'll be right back. Because Pat Healy Jr. in the third frame for the Hoinke Classic team, a strike, remember after two opens for Healy in the first game, and then Rob Causer for the Ebonite Crushar Club in the third, left the 2 4 six, ten, left the six pin, so an open frame, and we are dead even after three frames. And bringing us to Bob Bush for Hoinke Classic. Well, this is what makes the Baker system so, so much fun and such a challenge. Every match, all day today, these bowlers bowl the same format you're watching right now, except that you've got bonus pins for winning each game, where this is a two-game two total pin match. But the ex exciting part and the tough part is you only bowl twice each game, but also you have to bowl in a different, a different lane each game. Just got the 10 to kick out, and Bush converts in the fourth. Kurt Pisano, the uh, general manager at the Country Club Lanes here in Baltimore, and if that name sounds familiar, it should. He is the son, of course, of uh, Chuck Pisano. PBA Hall of Famer, Chuck Pisano. Doug Kent, fourth frame, Ebonite Crush R. Kent two for two in the opening game. Make it three for three for Kent. And Ebonite goes up by three with that strike. Here's a look at that shot again by Doug Kent. And this is experience for you. This is a different shot altogether than he bowled on lane 35. A little softer speed, a little deeper into the lane. In other words, he was more toward the center, gave it more room. And he got back to the pocket solid. And there's a good look at Dennis Baldwin, the proprietor of Country Club, Lane, Cl Country Club Lanes, Bob. And not only, not only is he a proprietor here, but he's also the owner of a bowling ball company. He's busy done, man. Done quite well for himself. Brian Kretzer, anchor man for Hoinky. 10-10 goes. Boy, I like to watch him bowl. He's fun. <laughs> He's fun to watch. He does cover some boards. He's so smooth. Very tight, exciting opening match here, the semifinals. Again, the winner will move on to the championship match. It's a 13-pin lead at the moment for Ebonite Crushar. In the championship match, Turbo 2 and 1 grips waiting for him. Chris Barnes. I think Chris needs a little more ball speed. He's been awful soft. I think a little more speed with his rotation would do the job. And uh, probably he heard me and just did that and was wrong, right? But Chris is really lost. He has yeah. no idea what's going on out there. This is a very difficult spare. It's a washout. The one, two, eight, excuse me, the one, two, six, eight, ten. It's not often you see no. the six in there with it. Watch how the ball hooks so hard in the back that it just takes the three pin out of the full rack and leaves the one and the six right there. That's hard to do. On such an unusual combination, Earl, how, how do you know 
how to convert this fair. You, you, you definitely want to hit the left side of the head pin. The ball will take out the two and the eight. The head pin will take out the six and the ten. Big ball for Barnes. Got. No, the ten wouldn't go. Oh, how that stayed up. Every pin seemed to fly around it or over it. Chris is right now very frustrated. He's had a tough week. He, uh, I watched him. I watched his, uh, his team throughout the match play as I was watching the other teams and just to see who was going to make it and how they were playing the lanes and so on and so forth. And Chris had a very tough time carrying the corner pins. He would leave things like solid eight, solid nine on perfect, what he thought were perfect hits. And the frustration starting to show. And again, that comes back to being a young man, only 22 or 23 years old, and letting him get to that. If that gets to him mentally, him in the anchor position, that's going to really hurt his team. John Murph, uh, an adjustment for Hoinke because Murph opened on his first ball in the, on this lane. And this is a big shot because it gives his team the double and extends their lead. And they're making great shots. They're paying attention. These young guys are really paying attention. They're talking to each other on the bench. You watch him sitting down there. They're saying, his ball did this. Did you make a good shot? Mm -hmm. Things like that. So they're helping each other. Things have turned quickly here. Hoinke up by 19. Sixth frame for Ebonite. And that's overcoming a 15-pin deficit after the first game. And they're doing quite well here. On the crossover, Klimpkin. So suddenly, Ebonite in a hole after winning the first of this two-game match. But Earl, things here, as we've already witnessed, and the Baker turn around in an awful hurry. It does, and it comes down almost always to your last two to three players. Basically, your fourth and fifth players are the key players. If, if you can get a strike in the ninth, you have a chance to really do some damage in the tenth. So, Ebonite is looking to that. I'm sure they're looking to Doug Kent, the Masters champion, to do something good for him and bring it to Chris Barnes. And if he can overcome that mental block he has right now and get out there and make two good shots, they're still in the match. But it's going to come down to those last two players, I'm sure. Chris Nicewainer, and uh, what an impressive television debut for this young man. 26 years old, and his first time on TV has not bothered him in the least. Nothing but strikes. And they can extend this lead. If they just keep striking, obviously it's over. I mean, they're just going to put these guys away. Uh, that's the easiest way to do it, but it's, as you know, the system is tough. How about four for four for Nicewainer? And his Hoinke Club teammates off the bench. And that's where you get out there and you know and you talk about experience and how important it is, and you make a fool out of yourself. Because <laughs> <laughs> you come back and you got five kids that, that have, have none at all as far as experience in front of the camera and uh, the several million people watching them nationally. Doesn't bother them a bit to go out and throw strikes. Russ Mills, big ball for his Ebonite team and leaves the 10. And Ebonite is really in a world of hurt right now. So you have to have this spare by Russ Mills, and then you're looking at a good shot of Chris Barnes right there. He's the anchor man for the Ebonite team. He's sitting there thinking, boy, that ball in the fifth frame really mm -hmm. put us in a hole. That was the turning point in this match, really. The open, the open by Chris Barnes in the fifth. At the same time, the Hoinke mm -hmm. team started striking. And Mills picks up the spare, but Hoinke up by 30 after seven frames. We'll be right back. Round match by match uh, here today, Earl. The Ebonite Crush Art team qualified for this round in eighth place and looked through the uh, through the day up to fifth and down to seventh, back to fifth, and finally qualifying as our number two seed. And the same uh, for Hoinke. They came into this round as the number four seed, dropped down all the way to eight for a couple of rounds, and then uh, slowly worked their way into the TV finals. And uh, we were, Hoinke had a 30-pin lead when we left after seven frames, but look, things have turned again quickly. The lead is now down to 15 because in the eighth, Pat Healy Jr., an open frame, he left the four, six, seven, and then left the six <coughs> pin. And Rob Causer for Ebonite answered with a big strike, so it's only a 15-pin lead for Hoinke. Bob Bush in the ninth. A lot of room there. And not back to the pocket. And this is a really a tough script. This is reminiscent of what happened to the Ebonite team just a few frames ago. Uh, here's a look at something that is a product of the bowling balls, I think, Bob, of today. The style of the player, 
is going to adapt to the lane condition and the bowling ball. And so the ball, everybody's trying to hook the ball a lot. And then you get a bowling ball that really gripped the lane on the back end, and that's what happens. You get those kind of spares that you never saw 20, 25 mm -hmm. years ago with plastic and rubber mm -hmm. bowling balls. That was a 1, 2, 4, 6, 10. And very suddenly, two open frames in a row for the Hoinkie Club. And Doug Kent, who has not missed yet in the ninth for Ebonite. Kent, three balls, three strikes. And what was a 30-pin lead just moments ago. This could take the lead, I believe, for the strike. It's all but gone. It's the type of guy you want in this ninth hole, Earl. He's been here before. He knows how to make good shots when he has to. But we can all make mistakes. Let's see what Doug does. As good as you can throw it yeah. right there. Four for four for Kent. And in the ninth, after nine, they have stormed from behind. And it sets it up, as you said a few minutes ago, Earl, it usually comes down to the anchor men, and here we are. Here we are. The advantage is Ebonites because they have the strike in the ninth, so they can make bonus pins, basically, you might say, by the first strike in the tenth. Oinkie Classic needs this strike. This is the one to get him going in the tenth. He has to have this one to have a chance. It's Kretzer, the captain. He'll cross a lot of boards here, a lot of hooks. Stay on the lane. Oh, my. Set his thumb as he... Looks at his thumb, and uh, the ball just gripped the lane early. That happened to one of his teammates just a, a, a two frames ago. Uh, it happens on the left-hand lane is obviously hooking more than the right-hand lane. Players are having a little more trouble getting it down the lane far enough to keep it in play. Again, it comes back to the bowling balls, and this is a, this really was the match right here. Without picking this up, three, four, six, seven, and three fra open frames in a row to finish the second game for the Hoinkie Classic Club. Chris Barnes glancing up at the scoreboard. Well, he Chris has had his trouble today. And, uh, you know, again, he was sitting on the bench with his head down. He wasn't really into the match. Here's his chance to redeem himself. He needs to make a good shot here. Long ball speed. There, very nice. There it is. And Kent, the first off the bench. Now, here is something that you won't see very often in a young player. He'll make a shot that is called for under a lot of experience, a lot of knowledge of how to make good shots under pressure. What he did was throw the ball very hard and very straight to keep it in play. He didn't give it a chance to get in trouble. Didn't cross a lot of boards, have the ball hook high on the head, anything like that. Threw it hard and straight, and here he goes again. Hard and straight. Keep the ball out of trouble. Just, you know. Mm -hmm. Here's a look at the first ball, the strike, the one he had to have. You can see the ball it doesn't have a lot of side revolutions, a lot of end over end, stays on line, goes right into the pocket. World brought to you by Lynn Shoes. For the performance approach, it's American-made Lynn Shoes, the choice of better bowlers worldwide. Bowling has long been one of America's most popular indoor sports. So popular that today more than 6 million people bowl regularly in leagues, competing on nearly 150,000 lane beds across the country. Although the actual lane is an instrumental part of the game, most bowlers don't realize how durable it actually is. Keeping wooden lanes looking like new takes a considerable amount of care. And part of that care is a periodic resurfacing. Here's a musical look at how lane resurfacing is done.
next telecast of the American Bowling Congress National Team Challenge will be the Grand Championship from Reno, Nevada. You will see the quarterfinals, the semifinals, and the championship match in three separate shows. Check your local cable listings. We'll be right back with today's championship event from Baltimore, Maryland, right after this. Second game for the Ebonite Crusher Club, Chris Barnes. And he made the, the really crushing shot when he really had to right here. A lot of ball speed, hard and straight, needed to get a mark, and the best mark there is is 10 in the pit, and that's what Chris did. There's his reaction. The team's up off the bench. They're excited. Slowly getting up, <laughs> but they're up. So the final score in the semifinal match, 405-379 total victory for Evan Crestar. 216-201 in game one, 189, 176 in game two, and that takes us to the title match. And the number one seed, Turbo 2-in-1 Grips from Detroit, and they are loaded, including the leadoff man, John Hersina. John Hersina is one of the finer senior bowlers in the PBA. And he right proved, that, bat. proved that right there, and he's proved it in the past by winning two senior events. He's also been the 1990 Senior Player of the Year. Uh, very strong individual, built like a bull, ex-male man, used to carry that sack around all over uh, the countryside, and uh, li John lifts a lot of weights, seriously, is where he got his strength, and he did it because he wants to be a competitive bowler. He's retired as a mailman now, and all he does is throw a bowling ball. 56 years old, he's in great shape, and he starts his club off with a strike. First frame for Klimkin. And trouble right off the bat for Ebonite. Ebonite with that huge comeback in our semifinals. They were down by 30 after seven frames of the second game, and here they are in the title game. But already in trouble in the first. This is Klimkin's third TV appearance this year. He's finished second at Fort Worth, third in Atlanta, and looking for first here in Baltimore. And he picked it. Got the 10 to fall. Big strike there early on for Steve Klimkin. Well, you know, I'll tell you, going back to the match before this one, Bob, it's my opinion, only my opinion, that the Hoinke Classic team should have won that match. They let him off the hook. They had him down by 20 or 5 or 30 pins with three frames to go. They went open, open, open. Ebonite has to feel very fortunate to be in the title match. And when you feel fortunate to be in the title match, you're loose. So this team, Ebonite, should feel very loose. They shouldn't have any problem getting going. And here's a switch in the lineup. They've moved Chris Barnes from anchor to second. Now, why would a team do that, Earl? Why is such well, a big move? They feel, I, I, my opinion, that Chris Barnes is in trouble on this pair of lanes. He hasn't really gotten lined up. The one strike he got, he threw 100 miles an hour. Uh, he hasn't really gotten lined up to the pocket, and he's so for that reason, he, remember I mentioned he had a little problem maybe mentally getting into the match. They probably get him up in the second spot where he can relax a little more. So there's less pressure in that number two hole. Huh? Exactly. And he responds to the change with a strike. Third frame for our number one seed, Dave Bernhardt. Qualifying average of 210. This guy can bowl. He's, uh, he's right up there in age bracket with, uh, of course, John Racina. But watch this release and the rev revolutions on his ball. He can play. He's a tough player. Tough leave there, the 210. Uh, we've seen it once before this evening. He'll try to hit the two pin on the left side, slide it into the 10. And, Bob, here's a look at how Turbo 2 and 1 grips got here. They were right near the top the entire way until, look, they dropped down to 8th and then jumped right back up to the number 1 slot. And here they are, the number one seed. And that shows you really how tight this has been all the way through. Uh, the, the, this is this of our 12 qualifying events to get to Reno for the championship. This was the tightest match play field I've ever seen. It was just unbelievable, as you saw there. A uh, team could go from eighth to first in one match, and that's just phenomenal. Normally, you know, they have one or two teams that are class of the field. They run away a little bit. Here's Russ Mills again. He's bowling. Russ Mills in the third, and the crossover for Mills. Mills bowled the, the second frame in our first. We are through three in this championship game. Game one, and Ebonite up by 16. We'll be right back.
two, two and one grips the number one seed after three frames of this championship match. Game one, remember it's a two game total pinfall. And Ted Hannes, fourth frame for Turbo. Three PBA titles for Hannes. Watch this approach. He starts way over by the ball return. He'll run to the left, run back to the right, and then throw the ball. Here you go. Take a look at this. <laughs> he kind of sneaks up on him. Oh, it sure works. Very effective. I spoke with Hannes before the match and also do a John Mazza, who we'll see next for a turbo. And they said they really enjoyed the uh, the team play, Earl. They, they loved, instead of competing against each other, as they usually do, they loved being on each other's team. They it's enjoyed great, it quite a bit. It's a great change of pace for the guys. Uh, and, uh, this is a unique experience for a lot of the pro players who, as you mentioned, both consistently one-on-one. -on -one. Rob Causer, fourth frame, Ebonite. Now what's happening here on 36, it's pretty obvious. You saw Russ Mills, he goes a little more direct, obviously, than Rob Causer, but Russ's ball, when it hit the lane, it skidded 50 feet, then went hard left. Went Brooklyn, carried the strike. Here's Rob, he watches that, he sees that happen, gives it a little room, it doesn't get back, much as it didn't get back for, for uh, uh, Steve Klemkin in the first frame when he left the washout. The ball skidded by the head pin, he got the washout. Uh, they're lost a little bit. What's happening on this lane is it's like the oil is carried down to the break point, the ball hits the break point and skids. If they start it sooner, it goes Brooklyn. So they're having trouble getting lined up. And a nice conversion for Causer. Yeah, his heart's starting to beat again. He <laughs> thought he missed that, I guarantee you. Yeah, you could tell when he turned around that <laughs> he felt fortunate. That brings us to the anchor man for Turbo, and it's a very familiar face to many of us, John Mazza. Qualifying average of 222. Mazza, of course, with four PBA titles to his credit. John, for two or three years spread there, was one of the best left-handers I've ever seen. He can play any place on the lane. He throws tremendous rotation on the ball. Right now, he's a little confused. Mazza joined this team, Earl, just uh, just this past, a few days ago, when he replaced uh, Bob Learn. Learn had to duck off at this tournament because of an injury, and they called John Mazza, and he said, sure, I'll give it a chance, and here he is leading them into the championship round. Well, John has here what they call the baby split, the 2-7, and he'll try to fit the ball between it. He'll switch balls, go to a very hard shell ball, throw it hard and straight, cross lane, try to hit the two-pin on the left, the ball will bounce into the seven. John, a good spare shooter. Throws hard and straight at these. And as usual, I'm wrong. He missed <laughs> it. He'll make, he'll make nine out of ten of those. I don't think they can hear you down there, can they, Earl? No, they can't hear me. If they could, they'd be up here hitting me. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we're behind glass. <laughs> <laughs> Bulletproof glass. Now, the, the, uh, the lineup change for Ebonite has moved Doug Kent, who was tremendous in the semifinal, they have moved him to the anchor spot. And that's the reason, as we mentioned, uh, Chris Barnes struggling. They get him up there where he doesn't have the pressure on him. Put the guy that's got four strikes already on this pair in the position where they need him the most to anchor. Can he make it five for five? He can. Kent is on fire today. Kent, of course, several times in the past has gone head-to-head -head with Mazza and others. Ebonai Kreshar now up by 26 after five in this first game back to the top now leadoff man john hersina he opened with the strike now here's where they got to get it going they've already bowled once on the lane they should know what's going on by now and line up and there's a great shot by Racina. boy he's steady isn't he he's tough he's very strong he can actually overpower the lane and you'll see him when we get up and when his next turn comes and i'll remind you to take a look at how far out on the lane john gets the ball before he releases it it's uh, eight nine feet out over the lane surface that's that physical strength. Some individual scores this week in Baltimore. 242 with a high qualifying average by Dwayne Fisher. 238 Brian Beavers of Baltimore. 232. And some high qualifying games. 299 Dwayne Fisher. 288. And back to Klimkin. Leaves the 10. Those scores are even more remarkable when you consider that they're, they're in team event competition. They're not one player just going out and bowling on a pair of lanes. That's a, that's a team game across pairs. Those are tough scores. This is a great score, 12-13. By the same, team. the top two uh, qualifying games by w the same team. Bowler's Choice, update line, right here, in, right here in Baltimore. And some of the high qualifying series, three games, 793. There's Beavers again. 
<laughs> Pat Healy Jr. 742 and Chuck Tillman of Baltimore 740. Those are great scores. Cross lane for the spare. And Klimkin converts the 10. And we are through six frames of this first game of the championship match. And it's Ebonite Crush R by 26 over the number one seed. We'll be right back. Of our two games in the championship match. Seventh frame while we were away, John Gaines for Turbo. A strike, and then Chris Barnes answered with a strike of his own. So Barnes two for two since the lineup change. Dave Bernhardt. Eighth frame, turbo. Got it! Bernhardt, after an open on his first ball, a solid strike here in the eighth. And here's a look at it well down the lane. Remember, 35 hooks a lot more than 36. Now in contrast, after watching the big hook from the old guy right there, here's a guy that's not much younger, Russ Mills, but he'll go a whole lot straighter. Russ Mills, eighth frame, Ebonite. And that was a good shot by Russ. Uh, he made a good adjustment. If you remember last time, the ball crossed over the head pin. He got the Brooklyn trip to six. This time, he makes a much better delivery, gets the ball out in front of him, and leaves the four pin. Russ, one of the better spare shooters around. He won't have any problem with this. And you're right. Right in the middle. There you go. Brings us to the ninth, and it's tightened up. Ebonite now with a six-pin lead. Ninth frame, still the first game. Ted Hannes, up for turbo. Hannes told me before, Earl, that he liked the format because he likes to root for people. And out on the tour, he says, you can't root for people. Well, he could, but, you know, they'd always think he was crazy or something. <laughs> but Ted's one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet in your life, and he's got a wonderful family. I bowled many a match against and with Ted Hannes. Big ball in the ninth. And a good break there for his team and, of course, for Ted. That ball was almost dead center of the head pin, leaving only the four pin. The last pins to go over the six and the ten. Hannes, 36 years old. Won three times out on the tour. This is a guy whose style or approach pattern nobody should copy, but as far as his arm swing goes, it's one of the better arm swings around. He converts the spare. This is Mike Bowers, ABC director. He's in the crowd today. His club bowled here this weekend and uh, did quite well, finishing in seventh. Yeah, we thought we might have Mike right here on the telecast, mm -hmm. and, uh, and we want him out there for the presentation. He would have to do double duty, wouldn't he? <laughs> he would have loved it. Yes, I'm sure he would have. This young man's been tough. Let's see what he can do right here. That ball speed there through the middle of the head pin. Everybody's struggling a little bit. The balls are starting to hook a little more. And most of these guys will not give up on those bowling balls that want to hook a lot. And they'll just mm -hmm. try to keep making adjustments no matter how much trouble they get in. They won't go to a ball that hooks less. They just want to stay with that. And they, like, they like to see that big hook. You've told me before, Earl, that you feel today's player uh, feels like they should strike literally on every ball because of the uh, that's right the ball today. That's exactly right. They feel that every ball they throw, if they get it anywhere near the head finish, mm -hmm. strike, and almost does. It almost does. Very tight after nine in our first game of the championship match. Ebonite Kreshar by four over the number one seed. Turbo two and two and one grips from Detroit, and this is John Mazza. Mazza with a spare on his first ball. Mazza wants his first eagle, he told me uh, before the show. I think if John has a weakness in his game, it's not in the physical sense of his game so much as the mental, and that would be that he gets down on himself too much. He's a very fine player. He's got a tremendous talent, and he's very analytical on how he plays the game. But I think sometimes he gets, gets to the point where he can criticize himself mm -hmm. too much and actually hurt his ability to make good shots. He said he was just as uh, excited about about this event as uh, any others, any on the tour. He says, this is, this is as good as it gets, and he was looking forward to it. Well, 
I can't argue with that. This is one of the finest events that anybody's come up with. I think this is a great event. I think it's a great promoter for the sport of bowling. And I, th I, don't, I have yet to see anyone leave this event, whether they made the top ten or not, that wasn't happy mm -hmm. with what went, what went on all through the week. Everybody talks highly of this particular Yeah, the word format. is spreading, too, and that's one reason we saw 80 teams here this week from over 20 states. And a waiting list, yeah. Just tremendous. And next year, uh, they're working on international competition and expanding the stops, and it's, it's tremendous. Well, I don't think we're going to have any problem filling up the bowling center. As a mm -hmm. matter of fact, if I was planning to bowl, I'd be starting to think about getting my entries in right now. Are <laughs> you planning to bowl? No. Oh, I, all right. I, I thought bowl. you were dropping a you bombshell. And me, Bob, you and me, we'll bowl. <laughs> <laughs> We'd be out early. <laughs> Doug Kent, anchorman. Kent is perfect today. Five for five. Crossover, six for six. <laughs> well, he didn't like the... He loved the result, but he walks back shaking his head. Well, I'll tell you, Kent right there, that's... Uh, that reaction you see out of Doug Kent, here's, here's the bowling ball, and I watch the ball right there. It starts to break and breaks very sharply on the end. Again, the resin ball going across the head pin, tripping out the nine. But his reaction was, uh, that was for us and the audience. That was one of those grumble, grumble, I made mm -hmm. a bad shot. And, but inside, his heart's going, boy, I'm glad I struck. I you feel great about that. That was good. You never give those back, do you? You never give them back. You may they not look be great on the score yeah. sheet. They look just you as good it. as the perfect shots. Now he wants to throw a real good shot here, and he'll probably leave a solid 10 or something. <laughs> well, he gave a little more room after that one crossed over and left the 2 and the 8. But he got the strike that really helped the team. And uh, The 10 is hiding back there, too. The 2-8-10 oh, for Oh, he left Kent. the 10. I didn't see that. Well, maybe yeah, you can do a little of, trick shot for us. That here. angle that you have, uh, you're out in the parking lot almost. Well, I got one of these good-looking young camera guys mm -hmm. out there with a camera that I can't see around, but I've got a monitor here. I should be able to look at that. Right? And he picks up the 2-8 and finishes our first game. Another another face in the crowd, Mike Lestowski, field representative, also a former Masters champion. 1983, I remember who he beat. <laughs> I bet you do. <laughs> Mike and I were talking about that earlier. Final score after the first game, 204-198 for Ebonite, so they have a six-pin lead after the first of two. We'll be back with the second one right after Steve Plimpkin for Ebonite Crush R. They won the first, 204-198, so they have a six-pin lead heading into this final game. And everybody thought, Earl, coming in, that the Turbo Club, the number one seed, would, uh, because of their lineup, would really have very little trouble. But here's Ebonite Crushar, and they're right with them after their dramatic semifinal victory. Two reasons, I think, for that, Bob. And one is that the Ebonite team is a little more loose than they might have been otherwise because they feel they got a gift in the first match. When the Hoinke Classic team opened the 8th, ninth, and 10th frame to give them that match, basically. And the other is that now they're bowling. Uh, the the uh, Turbo team, I believe, is bowling on the easier lane to score. And so it, it could turn around a little bit. But, again, uh, and one more factor, and I think it's a big one, the Ebonite team has already bowled a match on the pair of lanes, so they're more comfortable on the pair, and they know what the difference is between the lanes. Boy, Hersina just one after another. That's three in a row for him. Big John, he's tough. Big John can play with the best of them, and uh, he does, doesn't ever get tired. John can bowl forever. He'll just go out there and keep throwing it down the lane, and uh, he's always up there somewhere near the top. It was interesting, and talking to the players, Earl, that uh, the members of the Ebonite Crush R team told me that they thought it was a huge advantage for the Turbo Club because so many of them have been on television uh, in major events. And uh, then I, I talked to the Turbo people. I said, no, that's no advantage at all. But you feel it is. I feel it's an advantage. I think, uh, again, going back to what you just said, Bob, which is a very good point, I think it's definitely an advantage to have the experience bowling on television uh, because it takes some getting used to. And there is more pressure, and especially in the Baker system. Uh, the other thing is that we talked about this earlier, and you mentioned, Bob, and I thought it was a good point, that maybe there's a little gamesmanship going on mm -hmm. there before we go into the title match where they're saying, hey, you guys got the big edge, blah, 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 you know. And, Some uh, mind game. Sure, a little yeah. bit of a mind game, and that's, there's nothing wrong with yeah. that. They say there's no defense in bowling. It's strictly all offense, but there is a little defense. A little psychology goes on, and it's gone gone on for years uh, in, in the, on the PBA Tour. Carmen Salvino was one of the best. Was he? At making you think... Uh, uh, you know, he'd say something like, 
boy, you got a great arm swing. What a player you are. Mm -hmm. And then he go out and throw three in a row at you, and you wonder what happened. Would you fall for that? You're out there admiring your own self. You know? <laughs> thinking what a great arm swing I've got. <laughs> He's got three strikes sure. and you got a couple of spares. You're pulling out the wall. John Gaines. Gaines is three for three. For Turbo, second frame strike. Now Gaines is one of the guys that you may not recognize on the, in this lineup, but he is three for three today. And very strong, tremendous roll and re revolutions on the bowling ball. The whole Ebonite team, the whole Turbo team, all ten players are outstanding players. This is a great match. Mm -hmm. Last Four chance to lead. get to Reno. Last chance to get to Reno. And Russ Mills kicks out the seven. For Ebonite. You're right, 11 teams, Earl, have already qualified for the Grand Championship. The 11 winners from the previous stops. And this will round out the field, the winner of this match. Dave Bernhardt, third frame. Dave has uh, what I feel is... is really good fundamentals. He gets to the foul line well, he has great balance, he gets a lot of revolution on the bowling ball, and he's pretty accurate. Uh, a combination of that means he's tough to beat. He's a real good player. Demolee, Demolee. Crossover. That jumped right near the head pin. There is a spot on that lane, and we talked about it before. Even though I feel 36 is the easier of the two lanes to score on, I think that there is a spot there where the oil is carried down a little bit, and if you get it a little wide, it wants to sail, and if you get it started a little early, like he did right there, it wants to hook. Some of the players have been fortunate to cross over and carry the, the Brooklyn hit. He needs this Whoops. conversion. That's a disaster. He needed that to maintain the lead but it slips into the channel. What that does is it not only costs your team the mark and the lead and so on and so forth, but it, it uh, they look at each other and say, what the heck did that, mm -hmm. what happened, you know? And, uh, you know, it just doesn't, you just don't do that kind of thing at this point in the match and championship second game. I kind of like to know what happened. I must have hung up on his thumb or something, the looks of it. Fourth frame for Ebonite. <laughs> Very tense and tight. It is. And, uh, you know, that was an opportunity right there. After the big mistake by Dave Bernhardt, there was an opportunity right there for Rob to, to get the strike in the fourth frame, double up for his team, and take advantage of that mistake that, that uh, David made. And uh, he let it get off. And he's got to be careful. He doesn't give it right back with the spare. This is a tough spare. This is the three, the six, and the ten. He wants to get the ball just to the right of the three pin and take out the six and the ten. Careful. Oh, got away with one there, and he knows it. <laughs> Big sigh yep. of relief there. Shakes his head, smile on his face. He's looking at his team, and they're all looking at him like... You big dummy. We got one. <laughs> we got away with one <laughs> yeah. there. And there's a look at it. The ball kind of falls off his hand. It's probably six or seven inches left of what he was aiming at, but he got away with it. And like we talked about the Brooklyn strikes, as long as mm -hmm. they go down, they count. Ted Hannes, fourth brain, turbo. You know, I think Ted learned to bowl walking around a post someplace. <laughs> there must have been a bowling center with a big post in that approach. But he sure makes it work. He's tough and a uh, very good spare shooter. This is the third time, I believe, we've seen this particular leave, the 210. No one's picked it up yet. If anybody can do it, this guy right here can do it. He'll throw it hard and straight right down the left side. Try to get just enough of that two pin to knock it into the 10. Anna says that uh, he likes having the fellas on his team to, to help pick him up, he says. When something goes wrong, you know, you can turn around and the guy behind you is going to pick you right up. I've never seen Ted need much help before. I'll tell you, <laughs> he can be real tough. All right, tough spare. Slide it, slide it across is the idea. Okay. Got a chance, almost. And a key open in the fourth for Turbo. Adds up to a 23-pin lead for the Ebonite Crushar Club. 23 pins after four in this final game. And so far, everything going in the way that Ebonite would love to have it go right up to this point. They, again, I mentioned this the third time. They were fortunate to win the first match against Hoinke, the Hoinke Classic team. And now it seems like the Turbo 2-in-1 grip team is letting them get away with this one also. And there it is. 
Doug Kent puts him right back in the match. The Baker system, you'll love it, don't Boy, you? Boy, it, it just things makes, change here in a hurry. They sure do. Can you imagine? I know how it feels, and I'm sure that most everybody that's listening has been in that situation when you go bowling with your team and they want you to get that mark in the ninth mm -hmm. or the 10th frame. Well, that's what these guys are bowling right now. Every one of these five players is bowling a ninth and 10th frame for his team because they know it's the end of it for them, but they only have two chances to help. And so it's there's pressure. Believe me, there's a lot of pressure. And if you don't help, if you have an open frame like we just see, that's got to hang with you to your next ball 10, 15 minutes down the road. That's right. And you notice how the rest of your teammates kind of scoot away from you when you <laughs> sit down on the bench? I'm used to that. <laughs> look at John. Look at the, you see the look in his eyes now. This man can concentrate. Yep. He has a high level of concentration. He is a perfectionist. Now look at his eyes. They won't blink. They won't move all the way to the foul line. What do you say? Yeah, baby. Maza. Seven hey, pin. Maybe. Maybe. Oh, it fell off. <laughs> he thought he was going to get the seven to go. <clears throat> he was running it out, and a big smile on his face. His teammates are kind of kidding him a little bit. John doesn't normally demonstrate a lot of emotion, and right there he was tiptoeing across the lane. He thought he was going to get something. Now, John is a good example of a good spare shooter. He doesn't try to hook the ball at his spares. He just hits them hard and straight right at him like that. And he picks up the seven. Watch as he thought the seven was going to go on the first ball. <laughs> Not quite. That's a pretty good dance step there. <laughs> the lead, though, is down to eight after five in this final game. Ebonite Crescior leading by eight over tur Turbo 2-1. and one. We'll be right back after this. After three strikes in a row in frames six through eight, we're now in the ninth, and again, Ebonite up by 31 pins over our number one seed. Ninth frame for Hannes. And Turbo in a big hole. The strike by Causer, of course, gives them now a 41 pin lead. And the number one seed at Luxurl is about to go down. Yes, it looks that way. And I, I'm kind of surprised that. Uh, uh, that they didn't put on a little more of a demonstration of lane maintenance on that right-hand lane because this is, we talked about the experience factor, and this is as good as, as far as experience goes. This team is more experienced than any team that's been on mm -hmm. uh, in any of the 12 mm -hmm. This is the most experienced team we've had. Uh, they've got seven PBA titles on their team. They've got uh, two senior titles on their team. Uh, just a great team but they're just making a lot of bad shots when they need to make good ones. They didn't ever put any pressure on the Ebonite team up to this point. Ebonites had pretty much everything going their own way, but Ebonites had a lot of lucky hits. Crossing over a couple of good Brooklyns there in the last two frames. This has been Ebonite's day. Doug Ken in the 10th. It didn't matter. It really didn't matter. Uh, they just need to finish it out. They are the winners. Well, it's going to be a tremendous victory for, uh, well, for all of them, obviously, but for Klempkin and... Uh, and Barnes in particular, because they have tried several times. They've been in the TV show trying to get to Reno. In fact, they said when the year started, that was their goal, go to win Reno. Today was their last shot to get there. So it's a very gratifying win for those two. Well, it's been de definitely been the uh, the Ebonite team's day. There's no question about that, Bob. Coming down to the Hoinke team, letting them off the hook. And uh, uh, then here again, the same thing happening with the with the Turbo Grips team uh, letting him off the hook again. John Mazza will finish it up with his first strike of the day. He'll finish up the match. Boy, all the players beforehand, Earl, were talking about this team that Turbo put together, and they put it put it together at the last uh, last few days, grabbing Mazza and, and others to fill in some slots. And You know, it's kind of interesting when you say that, Bob, because both teams, both the Ebonite Crush R team and the Turbo team did the same thing. They, they kind of put the teams together mm -hmm. in the last few days, and here they are bowling for the championship. Two in a row for Mazza. <clears throat> So, so Ebonite's going to Reno. That's going to be a lot of fun. It is. And, uh, you know, like you mentioned, Chris Barnes yeah. and, of course, uh, <laughs> Steve and all the rest of the guys, they, they worked real hard at it. They wanted to win very badly. And, uh, you know, with three or four frames to go, it was still anybody's match. There was a lot of pressure down there, a lot of, 
a lot of the guys were sitting on the bench, not hardly breathing. You yeah. could almost feel the tension. Yeah, yeah it got tight here. But uh, Ebonite has pulled it out after a come-from-behind win in the semifinals. They lead wire to wire here in the finals, and they will move on to Reno. 19-pin victory over our number one seed, Turbo 2-in-1 Grips. Ebonite Crushar going to go to Reno with 11 other winners to compete for the grand championship and $10,000 that goes with us. 19 pin lead, 204, 198. And in our second game, 200 to 187. 19 pin victory for Ebonite. We'll be right back to meet them after this. The American Bowling Congress, championship service to bowlers since 1895. Make sure your league is ABC sanctioned. Buy the American Bowling Congress MasterCard. Get a grip on your finances with the ABC MasterCard. Buy Lynn Shoes for the performance approach. It's American-made Lynn Shoes, the choice of better bowlers worldwide. Buy Balfour, the maker of championship ring awards. And buy the Reno Hilton Hotel, host of the grand championship event. And here are your winners from the Country Club Lanes in Baltimore, the Ebonart, Ebonite Crush R team, a winner by 19, and they are headed to Reno for the Grand Championship. And we have some uh, tremendous prizes in addition to the $5,000 and the trip to Reno. And let's bring in first Mike Bowers, ABC director. And Mike has a presentation to make to the captain of this club, Chris Barnes. Mike, why don't you come on in? Chris, on behalf of the 2.7 million members of the American Bowling Congress, I want to present you with this award emblematic of your championship here today. Thank you. Thank you. Also, Mike Lastowski, ABC field rep, and Mike has a, uh, a gift for Chris and the other members of the winning team. Mike? Yes, uh, the champion shoes, good luck in Reno. I think these will serve you well. Congratulations. Thank you, Mike. And also Kurt Pisano, the uh, general manager here at Country Club Lanes in Baltimore. Kurt has a presentation also. On behalf of Country Club Lanes, I'd like to congratulate you gentlemen for some great bowling and present you with your championship rings. Good bowling. Thank you, Kurt. A very exciting championship match. Chris Barnes, uh, you've, uh, you've tried several times. You and some of your other teammates have tried several times to make it to Reno, and uh, you saved the best for last because now you're going. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure the best team won today, but the luckiest one did, definitely. Uh, we've been on the re receiving end of some key Brooklyns, and today we caught some of our own. And yet you stormed from behind in the semifinals, and uh, Earl Anthony told us on the broadcast, Chris, that he thought that may have been a key, that you escaped that semifinal and may have relaxed you for the championship match. Yeah, it's really hard to bowl in the championship match if you don't win the semifinal one, so uh, <laughs> we definitely needed some breaks to get there. Yeah. Well, congratulations to you and all the other. It was a great event here in Baltimore, and we will see you in Reno. For Earl Anthony, I'm Bob Dolan. Thank you. The next telecast of the American Bowling Congress National Team Challenge will be the Grand Championship from Reno, Nevada. You will see the quarterfinals, the semifinals, and the championship match in three separate shows. Check your local cable listings. Hotel accommodations provided by the Holiday Inn Cromwell Bridge. When visiting Baltimore, stay at the Holiday Inn.